next session and can I remind members and witnesses to turn off their mobile phones please or to switch them to flight mode because as we know mobile phones do interfere with the sound system and they make it difficult for the parliamentary reporters to report the meeting and also television coverage and web streaming can be adversely affected. We have reached item number seven on the agenda and that is engagement with stakeholders on the effectiveness and timeliness of consent classes in third level institutions. And the purpose of this part of the meeting is to have an engagement in relation to the effectiveness and timeliness of consent classes in third level institutions. On behalf of the committee, I wish to welcome Dr. Porig McNeila from the School of Psychology in NUIG, Dr. Brian Gormley, Head of Campus Life in DIT, Mr. Shane DeRees, President of TCD Students Union, Ms. Sheena Cahill, President of USI, Dr. Cleena Sadlier, Executive Director of the Rape Crisis Network Ireland, and Mr. Philip Crosby, who is the Principal, uh, Principal Officer in Department of Education and Skills. So the format of this part of the meeting is that I will invite you to make a brief opening statement, a maximum of three minutes, which will be followed by an engagement with members of the committee. Before we begin, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the Chairman to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. And you are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements that you have made to the committee will be published on the committee website after this meeting. And members, of course, are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the houses or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I want to thank you for your, your patience and waiting for us while we dealt with other business. This is a very important topic and it's something that all of the members felt that uh, we, we should examine and that we should bring universities and students, the students' voices, incredibly important in all of this. And of course, is the, the Rape Crisis Centre also. Um, so I would now like to call on uh, Dr. McNeila to make his opening statement, please. <coughs> Okay, so thank you, and um, I have the privilege of representing NUI Galway here today at the committee, and um, I just want to thank the, the committee for your interest in the work that we're doing. Um, at NUI Galway and at other higher education in institutions around the country to uh, support a culture of active consent um, among young adults uh, who, who are students in, in our institutions. So I'm also representing the Smart Consent Research Team, uh, which comprises myself and Dr. Siobhan O'Higgins, uh, Charlotte McIver and Kate Dawson at NUI Galway as well. So we work together as uh, putting together a program of research and practice uh, in this area. And uh, we've developed a program of consent education um, to support ourselves in NUIG and also other institutions as well. And we work from uh, a definition of active consent, and that's a really important definition to, to clarify. Uh, it's about ongoing, freely given, verbal or nonverbal communication uh, in relation to any form of sexual activity or intimacy, and which also reflects the person's internal sense of, of willingness as well. So it is quite complex once you delve into it. And uh, so we began in 2013 through a collaboration with Rape Crisis Network Ireland to first study people's understanding of consent. And we developed that program in 2015 uh, into the Smart Consent Workshop, which is a relatively short workshop, uh, thinking pragmatically, uh, as we must do in terms of implementation that lasts between an hour and an hour and a half. Uh, working with students, facilitated by uh, uh, trained facilitators, and who are supported by a manual and a full kind of framework of, of support behind them. 
And in terms of training, myself and Dr. O'Higgins have been very active in, in putting together a training program. So we've trained over 200 uh, students and staff members uh, as facilitators of consent workshops uh, since uh, 2016. Um, and over 4,000 students have now taken part in a smart consent workshop somewhere around the uh, nine or ten institutions that, that we have worked to directly deliver workshops or to train people who then uh, deliver workshops within an integrated uh, uh, program that they develop at their institution. Um, so it's one of the lessons that we have learned through the collaboration that we have done with so many people over the past few years is that uh, maybe four lessons in particular that I direct your attention to. Uh, and the first part of that is to have trainable, high quality materials that you can offer within that kind of workshop format. Uh, secondly, that you have to have a home within the institution. Uh, for example, embedded in student orientation or embedded within the curriculum. There has to be a place for it to be. And thirdly, that to embrace the goal of full awareness and culture change in this area, which includes awareness of sexual violence, uh, consent programs need to reach out to the full community of students. So it's not simply about workshops. And what we're particularly interested in this year is developing a media campaign. And I think in the long term, uh, because there does seem to be a sense that this is going to be rolled out um, quite widely, we really need to think seriously about going beyond that kind of workshop format uh, to embrace, for example, a theatre performance-based format that can be used. Uh, for example, the, the model that's available from several US campuses. And we had a, a theatre troupe from the US working with us in the past few weeks to tell us about their work. And finally, it has to be made sustainable. So it's great to do this work, and we've, we've really learned a lot. But in the long term, this has to be taken on board in terms of the policy framework within institutions. And from the definition that I gave you, I think it's really important to realize that that's a positive, active definition of consent. It obviously encompasses all the issues of non-consent and sexual violence, sexual assault, and harassment. But we feel where students are coming from with their limited, often quite limited, sex, sex uh, education that they've received at schools, that we really have to meet them in a very positive way and to work with them in terms of the young adulthood that they're experiencing this kind of sexual uh, activity maybe for the first time, so that it is not perceived as a threatening encounter to work through a consent workshop, but that it is more of a liberating or fun experience that you can have with your peers. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McNeila. And I'm now going to ask Dr. Brian Gormley, please, to make his statement. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I thank the committee for the invitation to attend today's session to contribute to the discussion on this important issue. DIT considers the area of sexual consent as an issue that is deeply con connected to positive student engagement and to gender equality. And we welcome the focus on this area nationally. In DIT, and more specifically in campus life, our aim is to deliver the best student experience to the 20,000 students in the Dublin Institute of Technology. We provide free healthcare, counselling, pastoral care services, career development, accommodation support, financial aid, learning support, and sports societies and volunteering activities to our students. We work in close partnership with our students' union, and I'd like to acknowledge the work carried out by the students' union around the area of sexual consent in DIT. Uh, DIT prides itself on serving a diverse range of students, mat mature students, students with disabilities, international students, full-time, part-time and CPD, continuous professional development, and ranging from apprenticeship, undergraduate de degree programs to PhD research. In campus life, primarily, primarily through our counselling and health services, we see the impact sexual violence and unwanted sexual co contact can have on students, and we're working hard to develop a proactive effective approach to tackling the issue. The aim is to introduce a positive change of culture, to develop a more respectful community, to educate students and staff around consent, and to ensure that our policies and procedures can be used effectively to support and protect all our students. This year, for the first time, a short video on consent was delivered at our orientation to all our incoming undergraduate students, over 4,000 of whom commenced in DIT this year. However, we recognize the need for a more in-depth approach. As with many of my peers across the higher education sector, 
I do not have any specific expertise or qualifications in the area of sexual consent or sexual violence or harassment. And as such, we rely on the research and outputs of projects such as the NUI Galway Smart Consent Project and the ESHT Project, which is Ending Sexual Harassment and Violence in Third Level Education, of which DIT is an active participant. And we expect that the outputs of the ESHT Project will be delivered over the next few months. In discussing the need for a more comprehensive training, we're examining the effectiveness of voluntary versus mandatory training and the impact that each approach would have on resources. In our submission, and I'm happy to discuss any of, of our recommendations or, or comments afterwards, we set out some recommendations which we hope will be a useful contribution to the discussion. The Institute in particular would welcome a national framework and guidelines on how to positively promote consent and in particular guidelines on how to effectively manage allegations of sexual assault between students who may be in the same program or accommodation block. I thank the, community for, uh, th thank the committee for this opportunity to make an opening statement and I look forward to discussing the matter further. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Gormley. And I'd now like to call on Shane DeRees for his, um, Shane's representing TCD Students' Union. Yeah. Thank you. The conversation around education on consent and relationships at third level did not begin just this year. This was a conversation initiated by students' unions and student support services many years ago. The vital and urgent need for more education on all issues relating to boundaries, consent and sexual relationships was identified in numerous surveys and reports. The 2013 Say Something survey by the Union of Students in Ireland found that 16% of respondents had experienced an unwanted sexual experience at their current institution. In 2015, my own union, Trinity, conducted a, a survey which revealed that one in four women and one in 20 men at Trinity had a non-consensual sexual experience. The survey also highlighted issues around ha harassment and stalking. It was evident a shift in culture, attitude and behaviour was necessary. It was clear then that more was needed to be done to tackle the crisis directly. The first step in achieving this was to initiate the conversation around positive consent in relationships through the development of consent workshops. The need for edu education on such a topic was further highlighted in surveys carried out on those who, had who attended the first pilot we ran in 2016. At this point, only 22.9% of attendees claimed to be well informed about sexual consent. This rose sharply to 64.7% following the workshops. In Trinity, in, conduction, in conjunction with the Student Counselling Service, the SU first employed the Smart Consent model from NUIG in rolling out the classes. This pilot was rolled out in first year student accommodation on a voluntary basis during the orientation programme. The primary aim of this workshop was to get the conversation and understanding going about what consent was and to have this as an ongoing topic during the year. It was, however, identified through participant feedback that there was a need to change this programme, this model, and develop one specifically for Trinity. Uh, we changed it by we would not have a PowerPoint presentation and the emphasis would move from didactic presentations to interactive discussions. The workshop would aim to become more inclusive and less heteronormative and through the content and case examples. It says in 17-18, almost 100% of the target population attended the workshops, and there was very positive feedback garnered from all the participants. Although the workshops were not mandatory, they were promoted in such a way to have been seen as a normal part of the orientation to college and the college residence welcome programme. The success of the workshops in Trinity can, for the most part, be, be accredited to their inclusive nature, from both planning and administration to the content itself. The workshops were designed in partnership with both students and staff, and are facilitated by both also. This is vital to creating a cultural shift on the issue and an encouraging participant engagement with the workshops. The, effect is, the effectiveness of the workshops is best evidenced by the feedback of those who partook in them. 99% stated the relevance of the workshops to college life. 87% agreed that they learned something useful. The model employed in Trinity has proven its value and effectiveness, and the necessity of the workshops cannot be understated. The challenge now lies in broadening the accessibility of the workshops. We operate in an environment where support services are stretched to the limit and the resources necessary to make the workshops available are not there. The workshops must also be supported by other initiatives within our institutions. In Trinity, we've already embarked on developing first responder training to equip staff and student representatives who may be presented to by a victim of sexual assault with the necessary tools to assist, as well as bystander training for those who witness an inappropriate situation and training them on how best to respond and best manage the situation. 
The period of transition from second level to third level is a formative developmental period in any student's life. It gives us the opportunity to ingrain positive attitudes towards consent in all students and embed it as a natural part of college life. It is, however, a conversation that should be started at a much earlier stage in the education of our young people and built upon as they progress through the system. If this committee, the department and the minister genuinely want to see change and genuinely want to put an end to sexual violence at third level, we need tangible support in the form of resources. The methods and models are ready to go. It's just we need the means to do it. Okay, thank you, Shane. And now we have uh, Shiona Cahill, President of USI. Thank you, Cahill, and thank you to the committee for having us here today. Uh, I'm before you here today on behalf of over 374,000 students across the island of Ireland. And I'm here because it's in fact a problem. Um, I'm here before you today not because consent is just the next new gritty issue uh, for the student movement to talk about or because uh, I or the student movement have all the answers. Uh, but because the issues arising now are a problem that is growing and we're not going to stand by as a student movement, nor have we ever, uh, and do nothing or be silent on this issue. It has to stop now, but we need everyone on board to make that a, a reality, including the Oireachtas members. The student experience is one highlighted to us by students and their students' unions across the country, and the issue around sexual harassment at third level or within and for this age cohort didn't start today or yesterday. SU welfare officers and unions deal with this coming into their, week, into their offices week after week. Sexual harassment has often and easily become normalised in a space dominated by, quote, being social and sharing more of yourself across multiple plat platforms online. Photos are screenshotted and saved. They're used to threaten, vilify or hold over. Students and young people are being hurt by this behaviour emotionally and physically and they're subject to assault, and more often than not, during all of this, they're telling no one. That's why in 2014, the Union of Students in Ireland led the way in creating and issuing the first survey of its kind in Ireland, and some of the key findings included that 16% of students reported having experienced some form of unwanted sexual experience while in their current educational institution, but notably only 3% recorded that they had reported these incidents to an official within their institution or to the Gardaí. The two most frequent reasons for not reporting were that they did not believe the incident was serious enough to report and that they did not think that what ha happened to them was in fact a crime. We are not being dramatic when we say that this is a serious issue and it is widely understood that students attending third level are in the process of handling a significant transition, one that affects all parts of their lives from academic standards, a distancing from familial supports and parental guidance, new living and rental condi conditions and experiences, new social and peer group expectations in terms of socialising and relationships. The USI has led the calls for improved RSE, Relationships and Sexuality Education, before students even reach third level, as it is the daily experience of our elected officers on the ground that students are ill-equipped and do not have a satisfactory level of knowledge around sexual health, well-being and respectful relationships, including understandings and the language around consent. Sexual health awareness has been a key awareness uh, and point of USI plan of work for over two decades. And we welcomed the Joint Oireachtas Committee report on the Eighth Amendment, which indicated that resources needed to be allocated to developing our systematic approach to sexual and reproductive rights in Ireland. I mean, looking at the, the DRCC at national helpline figures indeed for 2016, the age group 18 to 24 and 24 to 29 makes up almost 30% of their overall callers. We have identified in USI that there are gaps within the third level system in accessing safe ways to raise concerns and to get an effective remedy uh, for those issues arising. And there's significant consensus across the board and across sectoral stakeholders that consent education is required at third level and broad consensus that consent needs to be mainstreamed into the education of young people and students. We need more than a poster awareness campaign or social media content. Funding does need to be made available. A second say something report in relation to research needs to happen. The consent education must have a sex positive approach and also be inclusive of the LGBTI community. It must be student-centred and peer-led along with professionals. And we need our staff to have first responder style training so that in the event of disclosures, uh, post-consent education, that there's somewhere for you to go. On that, there needs to be significant changes to the reporting structures at third level, 
and we believe a designated staff member needs to be appointed in third level colleges. So the stats are clear and there are people behind them. We cannot pretend that it's not our responsibility and we must do something to act. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheena. And I now go to uh, Kleena, uh, Dr. Cleena Sadley, our Executive Director of Rape Crisis Network Ireland. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation to Orsi and I to speak to you today on this matter. This is a, a timely intervention. <coughs> Sexual violence has been much discussed recently and the question now is what actions can we take to move beyond the awareness into creating the change needed to build safety and freedom from sexual violence. Orsi and I believe HEIs have a significant role to play in prevention. The third level sector is an engine for the production and reproduction of our culture and as such we would welcome these institutions fully, consciously and critically engaging in transformation towards prevention. The task this committee has said itself benefits from the industry of a range of academics, welfare, welfare professionals and student leaders who have invested their expertise, resources and passion into devising and testing a range of curriculum interventions such as consent classes, bystander training, workshops, online resources um, and interactive and performance models of exploration on these issues. Um, some of these specialists are here before you today and can speak more expertly than I on these aspects. With the right climate, and this is what we would add, these pockets of excellence can be nurtured and sustained into the future to continue the essential work of evolving and developing engagement with our ever-changing culture in order to create tools towards safety and sexual violence, from sexual violence. Orsi and I would like to make a key point to you about consent classes in third level. They are not standalone solutions to the challenge of addressing sexual violence. And the work is not complete if and once the best practice and proven classes are embedded across HEIs. Indeed, we would consider it a failure if we limited ourselves to consent classes. Consent classes need to, be, need to form one part of a whole of system approach in order to have sustainable and positive impacts. A whole of system approach would involve a critical engagement of the institution, um, accountability and proactiveness in creating safety. This might include, for example, consent and bystander programmes integrated into induction programmes for all entrants, as has been achieved in the IT and Tralee. Um, consistent, visible, year-round zero tolerance promotion across the campus on and offline. A protocol on responding to all sexual crime incidents. A policy on supporting an individual who has reported an incident, including establishing a tailored support plan for the duration of that person's education. A policy on responding to the individual against whom allegations have been made. HR and CPD strategies, which, which are gender-proofed, to ensure a professional and consistent support infrastructure is provided by the HEI in line with the above policies and protocols, which is visible to students, accessible and valued as a professional part of a staff member's role. Staffing awareness, CPD and gender proofing and equality measures to reflect an institution-wide engagement with embedded inequalities that facilitate rape culture. Other jurisdictions, or other jurisdictions have examined this matter in detail, meaning much of the research and evidence is now available to us at this point. For RCNI, and I, a key barrier to sustainability, um, sustainable success in preventing sexual violence is that expertise keeps falling away due to a lack of infrastructure and investment in specialisation. I would draw your attention to the fact that no institution, dedicated funding stream or academic topic specialises in sexual violence. We would contend that identifying and valuing multidisciplinary engagement and sustaining academic specialisation in sexual violence is a critical part of the effectiveness of any third level approach to the prevention of sexual violence. This committee, in reflecting on these issues, might ask what government can do to foster the sustainability of this expertise. So in conclusion, um, we would recommend that first we have the consent and other workshops on prevention and sexual violence that they would be informed, they would be evidence informed, evolving and embedded. Secondly, there is no shortcut to a whole of institute response and consent classes should be parallel to, to ensuring the appropriate structural responses to sexual violence and primary prevention across the whole of the institution. Thirdly, and lastly, the standing this focus and subject has in our HEIs, the space provided for reflection and intervention and the value placed on this work is critical. 
engaging new entrants to all HEIs in their culture to create a safe place to learn and freedom from the fear of sexual harassment and violence is a key part of that transformation. Supporting institution-wide engagement is the rest of the work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dina. And finally now, um, I move to Philip Crosby, who is representing the Department of Education and Skills. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for the uh, invitation to um, the committee meeting today to discuss the issue of consent in third-level institutions. As the committee will be aware, <coughs> all of our publicly funded third-level institutions provide a range of student support services, including counselling and health services to their students. In conjunction with these services, the third-level institutions support the student unions in their campaigns and initiatives on sexual health for students. In recent years, a number of third-level institutions have established sexual consent programs and workshops for their students. These programs and workshops have a significant positive impact on the students. Examples of the programs include uh, NUI Galway Smart Consent Workshops, uh, which were developed from a recognition of positive health promotion as well as an awareness of sexual violence. NUIG has assisted in the rolling out of these workshops in a number of other higher education institutions. University College Cork's Bystander Intervention is a six workshop module on bystander intervention for first year students in its law, nursing and applied psychology classes. The student unions are an integral element to the provision of such information to the student population in the higher education institutions. Every year, USI holds its Sexual Health and Guidance Week in the higher education institutions throughout the country. The issue of consent has been a significant feature of their recent campaigns. I would also like to acknowledge the significant work being done by the National Women's Council of Ireland under their Ending Sexual Harassment and Violence in Third Level Education ESG project. This project aims to ta tackle sexual violence and harassment in third level institutions and that their It Stops Now website is an invaluable resource in this area. Minister Mitchell O'Connor has stated that providing excellence in education depends on providing a safe learning environment free from sexual harassment, assault and the fear and threat of it. In August 2018, the Minister launched the latest report of NUI Galway's Smart Consent Team on Sexual Consent among third-level students. And on the 4th of October 2018, the Minister brought together representatives from the higher education institutions, student unions and other stakeholders for a meeting on consent and tackling sexual violence in third-level education. The Minister is currently examining the issues that were discussed at that meeting and will shortly be establishing a working group to devise a toolkit of appropriate initiatives and interventions that will be made available to the higher education institutions to deploy within their institutions. Uh, I hope I've been of assistance to the work of the committee and I'm happy to answer any questions and provide the committee with additional information it may require. Okay, thank you very much, Philip. I'm going to go to the members now to ask them if they would like to, yeah. Um, Deputy Murphy, uh, Deputy Byrne, sorry. Uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks everybody uh, for your simple, uh, concise, uh, effective presentations. Can I ask, um, I just noted that I don't think USI or the uh, Rape Crisis Network, Dr Sadler, mentioned the SMART program in Galway, and I know it was funded by the, by, by originally by the Rape Crisis Network Ireland, I understand. Um, no, they, they're a piece of research on initially. consent, alcohol and, and uh, okay. sexual violence, okay, was funded, sorry. which then... Okay. Can I ask, maybe other people can comment on is the, you'll probably say it is, but is the, is the Galway initiative the gold standard now in this country in relation to consent at third level? Um, uh, what are your funding requirements on an ongoing basis? What can you do with the funding that you have? And can any of your uh, research be applied to second level? Uh, in terms of what the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, they understand, is doing. Can I ask Sheena Cahill what she meant by um, differing cultural norms from international students, what, 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 what she had in mind in relation to that? Just to thank you all for, for that. Then. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take questions from all of the members and then we'll revert back. Uh, Deputy O'Sullivan. Yeah, my main question really is around... Um, I think Brian raised the issue of whether it should be voluntary or mandatory um, when, you, when, when you're contributing and it's been touched on somewhat by others as well in terms of, I think Trinity has um, workshops that are timetabled for those who are in halls of residence. I teach Lee uh, um, has something for all of new entrants. So I suppose my, my main question really is around um, 
Uh, and uh, the Rape Crisis Network talks about, um, you know, that it's not just about consent classes, that it needs to be a whole of institution. So m my main question really is around that, that whole issue around to what extent do we reach those, everybody that we need to reach? Um, uh, and uh, sort of a subsidiary question, I suppose, and maybe Sheena might best answer this one, is around, is it mainly the people who are concerned that... Um, something will happen that they haven't given their consent to who would go to the workshops and what about the people who are likely to assume consent when it's not being given i suppose my question really is how do you get to the people who may be the main cause of the problem if i can put it that way um, and that's really why my question is around this question of should it be voluntary or should it be mandatory uh, and to what extent do you reach um i suppose the people who are on both sides of the the consent question um, and then I, I was just interested in the IT Tralee one where um, I think it was Cleana mentioned it um, around um, you know whether that's one that we should actually get some specific information on for the committee and um, I think Sheena re referred to the fact that the Eighth Amendment Committee I was a member of that um, it was a very important ancillary recommendation around the question of um, you know having appropriate and comprehensive relationship and sexuality education at all levels so maybe to fill up the question of you know to what extent uh, it's probably broader than what we're doing today but to what extent does the department of education have a role in ensuring that and i think shane raised the question of when they come to college that you know some of them uh, you know already they haven't had very much in terms of of um, information and, and and specifically around consent so i suppose my question really then to philip is around the role of the department of education and not just you know, identifying good practice in certain places, but ensuring that that good practice is spread right across um, the education system, both, uh, you know, at appropriate, age-appropriate levels, but at higher education level, but also maybe at the, at the, the pre-higher education levels. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Martin. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, and thank you, everyone, for uh, presentations today. I have questions for myself, and Senator Lynn Rowan had to run over to the Shannon, you would have seen it there a minute ago, um, and she has questions here for me she asked me to ask too. Okay, so for, for myself first, um, I think Sh Sheena was sort of indicating this anyhow, but just to ask, should all third-level institutions have a, a dedicated liaison officer with office with trained personnel to oversee the reporting and handling of sexual harassment and assault allegations because currently it seems that the reporting structures can be quite unclear in a, a number of institutions and I, I would presume that lack of clarity would act as a disincentive um, to students reporting incidents. Um, is there any process for collecting data relating to sexual assault incidents on campuses at a national level? Um, and could collection of data inform a standardised approach to consent classes across Ireland? Should there be a standardised approach to providing consent classes across all institutes? Um, and would that help develop best practice and allow shared learnings and avoid duplication maybe of, of efforts? Um, what others have mentioned, do you, do you believe we should be starting earlier at post-primary or, or even primary? And is there any potential there that the HEIs could work with the NCCA in developing school, school curriculums or consent-based curriculums that complement each other? Um, and also, uh, I think Deputy Sullivan mentioned too, do you think that consent classes should be um, compulsory? Because how do we ensure that those who need the classes receive them? Um, for Senator Ruan, there are three questions. Uh, the first two are to everybody. Um, and she says, most universities operate under dignity and respect policies, and how well does this work? What would an adequate framework look like for responding to reporting of rape and unwanted sexual contact? Because when we introduce consent classes, there will be a rise in reporting. And her second question to everybody, how are consent classes currently funded and what is needed to sustain and grow these? And then to Shane, can you give us an idea of what is involved in consent classes? Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Martin. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, just like to thank all the participants for their, for their contributions. Um, some of the questions have been touched on here um, by my colleagues. Uh, I suppose the one the question springs to mind, are we coming at this too late from your perspective? Should we have, uh, I suppose, this, Philip, maybe more for yourself? Um, I think other speakers have mentioned as well, should be introducing this at a more appropriate level. 
um, before they get to third level at all. Uh, since uh, it appears to me from listening to your contributions that there's a lot of good work being done in this area uh, by different people. Everybody seems to be doing their own thing. I'm just wondering, is there any joined up thinking between everyone that there's a sharing of ideas, uh, let it be from a department down or across the universities per se? Uh, I'll be interested in your comments there. Since um, this has been introduced, has there been a drop uh, in the number of uh, uh, sexual assaults reported to the universities? Uh, um, what's the data uh, in, in relation to that? And funding was something that came up uh, quite regularly there. Um, if we're serious about this, do, do we need to provide the necessary funds to ensure that the recommendations that are made will be actually carried through? Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Murphy. That's right. um, yeah, just a couple of quick questions kind of along similar lines. Um, first one is Podrick McNeil mentioned that the, the limited education that exists in schools is kind of seen in the work that you're doing in, in Galway. Can you explain how that's seen, what, what the impact of, of that uh, is? Because obviously it's linked to the points about a holistic approach. Third level institutions don't exist as an island. Students have lives before, after, during, outside of, of those institutions. Um, the second point is I, I read the, the report on the, the results kind of from, from Galway, which are, on the one hand, they are illustrative of the problems that exist in our society in terms of the prevalence of sexual harassment, the prevalence of you know, bad attitudes in terms of consent and so on. Um, but the other thing that comes across very strikingly is the impact of the consent workshops that on all the different metrics, the pre and post is significantly kind of improved in terms of uh, awareness. Um, so definitely taking the point about the need for a holistic approach, and this is one aspect of, of many, there's obviously a very strong evidence base now for consent workshops. I'm not sure if anyone mentioned them, like, does anyone know what percentage of students would receive consent workshops at the moment? If you have you know, X number of, of students, what percentage, and I presume the percentage is quite small at the moment that we're, that we're dealing with. And, you know, if we have and have an evidence base for saying this is an important element of education around sexual health, consent, etc., um, well then, and this is the key point of all of the, the contributions and so on, how can we make it more accessible? Um, and also, does anyone have a, a figure in terms of what it would cost to put the resources in that are necessary to roll this out on the kind of basis that would be needed to make it accessible? I mean, the compulsory, not compulsory question is an important question, but at least that it's accessible as the, as the starting point for every single student at uh, third level. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm just going to add a little bit myself, if I may. Um, essentially, we're here to examine the effectiveness, the timeliness, and also to look at the delivery of the different types of, of programmes because while certainly those colleges and universities that are rolling out programmes have to be absolutely commended, and particularly, I think, in relation to where we see students and their peers receiving training to help others, it definitely needs to be commended. But there is a variety of, of different approaches. So part of really what we want to do is to look at the standardisation and who delivers the actual programmes also. I think we all accept and acknowledge that, that there is a need and it's very heartening to see that in the last 12 months that in colleges, that a, a, a number of colleges, that the number of students taking the courses have actually jumped by 600%, which is, it's very heartening that young people themselves are recognising that there is a need for this and that they're willing to participate. And I suppose that goes back to the question that Deputy O'Sullivan was talking about, is like, should it be mandatory um, or should it be voluntary? And also there is a question there in terms of even uh, funding for universities and for ITs. Uh, should funding be from government be dependent on delivering these classes as well, because it is something we absolutely have to take very seriously. Um, so, you know, you know, for young people, just understanding more about what consent means and helping support them and their skills of, of communication when they're 
at a vulnerable stage in their lives to minimise the risk of inappropriate behaviour sexually is, is absolutely hugely important. And um, I, I suppose like, a lot of the, the questions I suppose that I would have answered are around that. But the key thing is while you know we're discussing and this is very much around third level do we need to start at, at a secondary level as well too? And I suppose that's something that I would per particularly direct to yourself, Philip, like, you know, from the Department of Education point of view, is this something, is it, like, do we, do, does the department feel there should be standardization? Does the department feel that it should be mandatory? Does the department feel that this is something that should be introduced at uh, second level bef while preparing young people for taking that leap into the world of third level and, and further education. And maybe there are plans to introduce uh, consent classes to post primary, maybe you could tell us about that. And then obviously the element of funding that is needed uh, is very important. I want to thank those, um, particularly the Rape Crisis Network too, in terms of the very practical suggestions that you've made. I think they're very useful. So I'll go back now to the stakeholders, to the witnesses, and if you indicate, um, I'm happy to take them or whichever. Okay, Shane. I think it might be good to start with kind of what the con content of the workshops that we employ in Trinity are, because they are modelled off NUIG Smart Consent, but we remodelled it in a way that it was less teaching people what consent is, teaching people how to act, and more about stimulating their own thought and their own understanding and their own conversations around consent. So the workshops are very simple format. They last about an hour, an hour and a half, and um, begins with just kind of general warm-up session, kind of icebreaker. Um, and then we used the FRIES model, so that was, I think, originally employed by Planned Parenthood in the US. So FRIES stands for freely given, retractable, informed, enthusiastic and specific. And then we then move on to the case kind of case by case study. So case by case examples. And they're open ended. So it's, it could be a relationship, something that's happening after a night out and open ended. And then we ask the students to say, how should this situation proceed? And then that gets them thinking about what they would do if they were in that situation. So it's very simple. It doesn't take a whole lot to roll out but it is a matter of making them more accessible to beyond. So we, we roll them out in the first year residence in Trinity Hall, and it's a very targeted population. Their first years coming in, and we had 100% attendance from them because it, it's now a normal part of the orientation to there. But to make them available to the whole college requires resources. So we train student facilitators who, in partnership with a, someone from the Student Counselling Service, they facilitate the workshops. So it does take resources in the form of the counsellor itself and in training the students to carry out the workshops. But what we've experienced now is incredible demand from societies, sports clubs, college sports um, department to roll the classes out to their members and people who use their facilities and services. So there is ways, about, ways of rolling them out beyond the first year hall of residence. It's just getting resources to make sure we can do that. Um, so the content is very simple, but it does work, um, I see the, the figures we have feedback say that people feel much more informed once they've sat through the workshop. It's not just sitting through the workshop, it's engaging with the workshop. It's about creating a positive atmosphere around consent rather than it being this is what consent is. It gets students thinking about what consent is and yeah, it, we, we're very pleased with how they've done. We just need to make them more accessible. Great. Thank you, Shane. And I should point out too that recent research did show, um, I think it was DCU had led on this, that it's 50-50 it's um, males and females, and that, that's really important as well too, so it's just important to note it. Uh, Brian, I think you're next. Yeah, um, sorry, there was a lot, of, uh, there's a couple of questions I, I might address, is that okay? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, maybe just to talk about the, the voluntary versus mandatory, uh, and I, I suppose from a, a manager in, in a, a university, it's, it's um, mandatory is, is a challenging uh, concept when you talk about uh, things like orientation um, and essentially if you say mandatory you say essentially you're not going to graduate unless you've completed this this program so that's I, I don't think what we're looking at um, so but I, I think we can put it into something like orientation and we say orientation is required and you have to do it but if really if if you miss orientation um, as many students, well, not as some students do, uh, you can still progress. But I, I think if you put it into something that is a cultural norm within the, the institute, 
then you can get over 90, 95% of, of the students. So certainly our, our approach would be that the, the most effective way to make sure we get the vast majority of the students is, is to incorporate it into a, an orientation programme. If we try and insert it into the academic programme, we face significant challenges because our, our first year students in particular are kind of timetabled 35 hours a week for engineering. Our apprentice students are, are again, timetabled 35 hours a week. So that, that's very challenging. But if we get it into the orientation, uh, we, can, we can get the vast majority of students. I think there's a real value in the, the voluntary programs like the smart consent pro programs because you may be preaching to the converted and the people who go to a voluntary program are people who are supportive of, of these I ideas but they are generally the student leaders, they are generally the opinion formers on, on campus and they are then the people who can call out behaviour that they see and highlight behaviour that, that is inappropriate and, and kind of bring it to our attention. So. Mandatory, I think, is a strange, is an unusual word in, in higher education, uh, much as you think that we, we can set, set it down. Unfortunately, sometimes we can't. Um, and I'm happy to say, you know, I, I would hope that next, next year in, in TU Dublin, and I'd like to thank the committee for their support in, in that, uh, we're working with our colleagues in, in Blanchardstown and Tala, and certainly everyone's supportive of incorporating consent classes in, into orientation. There was a question, uh, I think, uh, Senator Gallagher asked about, will we see a drop in reported sexual assaults? Uh, I, I think we will actually see an increase in reported sexual assaults, and I think the increased awareness uh, and the increased um, willingness of, of students to call out uh, unacceptable behaviour and the recognition by students that uh, something that happened to them shouldn't have happened, uh, and they, they will be now more willing to report it. Uh, and just from talking to our counselling uh, service, we had over a five-year period, there's probably about five or six uh, reported rapes or attempted rapes each year. Now, sometimes on campus, sometimes off campus. Uh, we're not aware of any of those that have been reported, that they, they were dealt with by the counselling service, and the counselling service supported those students, but they didn't progress to the Gardaí uh, or to the u university authorities and that from talking you know the, f from the feedback from the students is one, one that alcohol was involved and they weren't they, they were weren't aware if consent was was given uh, um, which is, is is one and again the, I suppose the issue you know, well alcohol is sorry I could go on about alcohol um, so, and the other one is that if they reported it, they were not comfortable that they would be treated fairly uh, and that the, the process of reporting it may be more challenging for them, uh, then, you know, it would make the situation worse, essentially. And obviously, that's an area that we have to work on um, seriously. The uh, Deputy Martin asked about the, the standardised approach for dealing with, with, uh, dealing with complaints, and that would be very valuable. Uh, and I'm, I suppose, not speaking on behalf of, of all my, my colleagues in, in student affairs across the higher education uh, sector because we're all struggling with this. We're all trying to, to deal with this. Some of the smaller uh, institutions to get kind of legal advice around a framework that would assist in dealing with these complaints uh, would be quite challenging. And I know previously the sector has dealt with kind of alcohol sponsorship on campus and things like that in a sectoral approach. Uh, and that framework has been very helpful. And even though it's recommended as, as good practice and it may not be kind of stipulated that you have to go down that route, the fact that it's recommended as good practice, very soon you have to implement good practice and, and it becomes uh, the norm. But that kind of framework would be, would be very helpful uh, for us. On the starting earlier and whether it should be, you know, the consent should be taught in secondary education, it absolutely should be. Um, and it should be incorporated in there, but that wouldn't uh, remove the onus from third level to continue with consent classes because you have to set the culture and the ethos and the values in higher education. Um, and I think I've probably spoken enough and I'll give okay, colleagues a chance. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Philip. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I'm just going to try and address a number of these questions rather than, you know, in, in general, rather than going sort of, you know, deputy by deputy or question by question. Um, I, again, if it didn't come out in, in my opening statement, I mean, I wouldn't want to at all understate how seriously the department and the minister, you know, take the issue of consent and the, you know, the, the, the importance that we attach to it. In saying that, I think in common with others, um, while um, the reality is that the issues of sexual consent and the culture, I suppose, behind that are very, very long-standing uh, issues for us all in society. The reality is that, th that I suppose, as an issue in higher education, it has come to the fore in relatively recent number of years. And for that reason, in common with others, I think the system is probably, I suppose, in a way, sort of catching up uh, and trying to develop initiatives and so on to respond to that. So in, while it's of considerable strategic importance to the department and the minister, I wouldn't want to suggest that the department is claiming any particular expertise or any monopoly of wisdom in relation to it. Uh, so for that reason, the department certainly isn't carrying a flag for any gold standard or any particular standardised approach. And in considering a, a kind of is there a gold standard, I think one of the things that occurs to me is if you look, for example, at... And I'm, you know, just, just I suppose the the contrast of, of of perspectives and approaches. I mean, it would seem to me that smart consent is very much around the, in, you know, the, the the issue of consent as it affects people in a situation or in situations at given times. Whereas the UCC bystander program has more to do with the culture uh, that surrounds what happens when we see something happening, when we're a third party and we see something happening, and try to create a culture that is. Uh, should we say less tolerant and less supportive uh, of, of kind of misconduct and uh, and and the the attitudes and particularly the sexist attitudes that go with that. Uh, so in a sense that, that in other words that they both have a role to play. And when you then turn to the SG project and when you turn to it stops now, what it actually does is it, it seems to combine those. Uh, so I mean really what I'm getting is, is I would and I wouldn't like to see any any of those being seen as a, as a, as a particularly um, um, gold standard to aim for. And for that reason, what uh, coming out of the workshop that was held on the 4th of October, or sorry, in October, uh, and what's planned next, the group that's been brought together, is to try and develop, uh, I suppose, a, a, a toolkit or a suite of appropriate interventions uh, that, that can be um, operated or implemented in institutions, and then to have some means of making sure that the institutions are accountable for doing that and for rolling it out. So, so that, I suppose that's, that's where I'm coming from in, in, in relation to that. And I, the reason I ask that question, and I, I accept what you're saying, it's, it's very reasonable, um, but if there was limited resources and we wanted to make sure that this was done, uh, is there any particular programme that, like, I mean, if, if, if UCG are rolling out the programme nationwide, do we fund them? Do we say that's where the funding goes and that they, they can take the lead on it? Or do we say that, well, every college can, 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 can do this? That's, that's, like, we don't really have an NCCA at third level. We don't have a centralised curriculum body at third level. Each university devises their own uh, programmes of education. So what I'm saying is here, you know, if to save a few quid, if we to do, but to do the job properly, uh, is, and I'm only asking the question, I'm not holding the flag, is Galway the one then that, that should be picked to say, right, you can have the limited state funding that there is, your programme works or has been seen to be working and we'll we, we, we support you uh, and you can then, you know, you're mandated to support the rest. One of the, uh, it's, it's uh, unfortunate just because of circumstances, I didn't get to attend uh, the workshop itself, but one of the, the, the pieces of good fortune that the department had was to have a lot of the leading experts in, in the field, including one or two people who are sitting uh, at this table in this room at the moment, and who will go on to be members of the group to try and devise that toolkit of initiatives. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm what I'm conscious of saying, while that group will produce a suite of measures. I wouldn't want the department or the, you know, the officials of the minister to be, as I say, claiming some kind of monopoly wisdom or that or preempting the work that they'll do. So I'm not able to say what that, and that group's work is just about to get underway and intended, by the way, to produce its, 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 its out, output in a very, very short period of time. You know? and, and just on that, I, I think as a committee we'd really appreciate if that could be sent to us um, so that we could circulate 
uh, I think that would be important. And just to say too that if there is anything else that any of the stakeholders or witnesses wish to add following this, please do so before we, we um, compile our own report. Yeah, I'm going to go back to Philip to finish. Sorry, we interrupted there. Yeah, and apologies because I suppose there were a, a, a number of the issues really that touch on the role and remit of the department. And, and again, just to come back to it, in terms of, and I'm conscious of two things. One is the issue of a standardised approach, uh, and, I, and I appreciate that when a standardised approach can avoid a duplication of resources. When you link the question of a standardised approach across higher education institutions with the question uh, that was discussed earlier about mandatory versus voluntary, I mean, it, it, one of the things that I suppose, first of all, from a, a good practice point of view, and I think this came out uh, in Shane's comments about, you know, tailoring something for, for the particular circumstances of a college. While there may be a suite of initiatives, I do think that in order to tackle the attitudes uh, that, that, that go with, you know, I suppose misconduct and that, that, uh, that, that are kind of, I suppose, you know, so negative in this space, it really does involve um, communities, you know, as in the community on a campus is where I think you get this right and where you get the best practice going. Um, so from that point of view, I think there isn't a one-size-fits-all that the department certainly would be um, in, in any space of that. And of course, there is, when it comes to the question of content of, as in, sorry, course content or student content delivered by the HEIs, there is an issue of academic freedom, and I don't think the department would be, certainly we wouldn't be in a space of directing or dictating uh, whatever, you know, the institutes themselves might do. So I think it's, you know, the, that the, the idea here is really to make best practice models available to the institutions and then make sure that they, they deploy them as best they can in the institutions. I think if I can just come to the question of, is it too late? Uh, I mean, you know, the, 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 there is an issue uh, about, you know, sh would you be starting this work when somebody's at the age of 18 or 19, or would you be starting it earlier? As I, I don't want to comment any kind of personal sense on that, except to say that um, very recently um, uh, the former minister, uh, Minister Bruton, um, has um, called on the NCCA to initiate a review of the RSE programme in schools, and one, now there, I have to say that uh, RSE review co covers a multiplicity of different relationship and sexuality uh, education issues, but consent, what it means and its significance uh, is, is, is the first item on the list, I suppose, as, uh, you know, as, uh, as an issue to be dealt with. And the National Council for Curriculum Assessment are our experts in that field. As I say, I'm not sure when, as they go into this review who they will consult with, you know, but I have no doubt that the HEIs will have a role in that, if for no other reason than they have a role in teacher education and so on. But that really would be a matter for the NCCA. But the NCCA is due to report back to the Department and the Minister in the first half of 2019 uh, in relation to that review. Just, Chair, just yes. on that very point, sorry, yeah. there's only two of us left, so we're not going to hold up. Has anybody, obviously apart from Mr Crosby, been contacted by the NCCA on this review of RSE, of the, of the five of you there, or any of your organisations? Yes or no, I don't need to know the D. With the NCCA. Have yes. you, Dr McKenna? Have you initiated this contact with them? Okay. So that's two ways, is it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but very brief. We just to let people know because I think I mean, it, would it be an opportunity just to mention th some of the responses that I might have now? Mm -hmm. Or well, to be honest, I was going to let Lena yeah. in because sure. well, from my mind, she had indicated next, yeah. and then she yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, on the question of, of is it too late? Um, I mean, the answer to that, like, like like everyone else here, I think it's you know the earlier the better that we start. Um, however, I think, you know, it's never too late as well. I mean, I'm specialising a very long time in sexual violence, I'm still learning. Um, so it's, it's never too late. The, so, so it's an appropriate time to start intervening, in, you know, to, to do this work at third level. Um, in terms of the question of the reach, um, and if we want to use that word, mandatory, and I think I'd very much agree with, with uh, Brian there, and you asked about IT truly. I think what you're looking at there is about embedding and normalising. This, this content in things like induction and orientation that goes somewhat, and I'm sorry I'm flying through the different ones here, but that goes somewhat to the question of cost if you're looking at an existing infrastructure around orientation and induction and, and something, you know, that this becomes part of that, a normalised and embedded part of that, um, so it doesn't, that doesn't require um, a whole new infrastructure there in, th in terms of that. Um, what I would add, though, is that the, uh, in terms of who gets to have this conversation 
on campus. There is another aspect to this where, which is covered under the National Strategy on Domestic, Sexual and Gender-Based Violence, and that is that there is a gold standard of content being developed across the different subject matters in um, in third level. So what we're talking about there is that is that areas that are identified as having in your professional capacity that you're being trained for an interaction and a need to have some sort of knowledge around sexual violence. So let's say for example nursing, that you would have um, that there would be a gold standard developed around for example what every nurse should graduate knowing as a basic about sexual violence for example. So there's that aspect that's happening also um, in parallel to this work here. So this work is about all students. There's also a bit of a specialisation around it as well and targeting of information around domestic and sexual and gender based violence. Um, in terms of then the, you know, the, the, that slightly tricky question of, of you know, who, who volunteers in and who doesn't, um, I mean part of that is addressed by embedding it and normalising it and changing the culture in and around and you know, you're trying to basically surround those who, who aren't engaging to the point where, where they, they they're inevitably engaged because the culture around them, the context around them has changed. Um, the, and this is, this is where you begin to get into the question of, of so it's a multi-layered response. Um, it's not simply a workshop that people turn up to and your box is ticked there on that. Um, you, are, you are making sure that your visibility is throughout, that, it's, that, there's, that there's layers and layers and layers of response around here. Um, so that you are, if you like, surrounding the, surrounding the wagons on, on, on someone who is a reluctant participant in change, um, if you can put it that way. The, um, in terms of the question of standardisation, I think, uh, again, as, as Brian uh, alluded to, there, there's some standardisation, some aspects of this that would be incredibly helpful and I think uh, most higher education institutions would really welcome some standardisation around things like your, your protocol and how you respond um, and obviously a lot of the time you're responding to what is a crime so that has to be a multi-agency um, set of protocols that are worked out that will guide and help every H, uh, higher, in, higher education institution and I think they, they you know, most, most institutions would welcome that type of standardisation um, and, and, and also in terms of you know the other types of standard responses that an institution might might wish to um, or might that we might wish that that would be accessible there for students and visible there for students and and she has, has spoke about some of those aspects as well so in terms of standardization that would be a very important part of standardization um, in terms of the content of the curriculum I, I suppose I would be cautious about saying that there is that we, we if you like lock down you know in the way we would for if you like second level um, and even primary um, as as we as we move up if you like in cultural sophistication it becomes uh, the question of locking down a curriculum it actually becomes counterproductive because what we need is an evolving curriculum because our culture is evolving um, and and certainly in our experience around developing and delivering these 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 types of programs over over years they go out of date very very quickly if you're not moving with them so some of what you'd be locking down and what you would want to standardize is your criteria around that so you'd want to actually standardize for example that a a program is a learning program is an evolving and learning program and has built into it a learning and evolving you know capacity within it that is measurable you know so so that's what i'd say in terms of curriculum standardization the last piece of standardization um and a number of you have asked about the numbers and the data and the, and the counting of this and, and how we're tracking this and how we know what we're looking at. Um, this is an important piece around standardisation and again I think if we're going to start um, counting and recording and, and I, well the first thing I would say is that uh, we count very badly at the moment. There is very little data and visibility around this. There's a lot of unevenness. Uh, different institutions count differently in different locations because different locations in the universities are, and, the, and the ITs are doing the counting and taking responsibility for it. So it's a, it's a hodgepodge at the moment. Um, so, so we can't really answer the question of where do we stand right now in terms of data, in terms of knowing this. So I think there's the, it would certainly be a good thing if we could standardise how we count and what we're counting and when we're counting and who's counting it so that we can, in fact, begin to, to understand what we're looking at here and to measure impact. Um, and I think if we're doing it all together, that makes it, that makes it much more possible um, and a productive and a productive app. Obviously, you know, we benefit from the fact, because you've asked again about collaboration here, there's, there's, there's a lot of collaboration going on here, the universities themselves and the ITs themselves 
themselves have, have you know, organisations that do this type of work um, for them in terms of their shared building of standard responses. And, and you know, as, as these programmes and as these initiatives have grown, there's been the organic collaborations that we have all, most, that most of us at this table have engaged with. Um, so there's a number of those structures. And what I would say is the response here has to be collaborative, has to be an interagency, multi-level collaborative um, response from the administrative to the academic, to the student, to the NGO, to the department, um, to the HEA. Um, so I, th I think that that type of approach is how we're going to get there. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's what I have to say. Okay, thank Lovely. you very much, Lena. Uh, Sheena. Chair, Chair, just, Chair, leaving the impression now within the next 10 minutes for, okay. for the Dáil Chamber. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, um, and uh, Deputy Sullivan has agreed to... Um, well, step in while maybe we none of us left then. Like, so yeah. maybe, maybe I know. We'll have to finish it then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, Sheena. Uh, thank you very much. I know it's to be brief. Uh, it's, I just want to um, run through some of the, the, the queries quite quickly. Um, so, first of all, uh, Deputy Brown, just in relation to the, the smart consent piece, it was in our written submission. I just didn't refer to it in the three minutes I had. Um, and, and we would be incredibly supportive and have worked with. Uh, NUIG and the smart consent model around the feedback on how and how to progress it uh, since its inception uh, and that is I think something that I would kind of want to hammer home is that like where these the initiatives have been successful on institutional on, institu on institutes campuses it's where they've collaborated with student leaders and students unions to put them out there and that's something that uh, the smart consent model in particular has done. I, uh, the question about cultural norms um, is just uh, it's just the fact that um, in different countries and in different cultures, there are different uh, conceptions and understandings around consent and the language and around not it. The role of men and women. Um, well, that's also an issue. I mean, it's an issue, but it's not an issue that we accept if there's a. Yeah, gender norms and stereotypes also then coming into our institutions based on international students okay. needs to be something that we address absolutely. And yeah. it just, I suppose, my point, my wider point is that if we are putting out a consent. Uh, you know, workshop or education, it needs to be inclusive. So it needs to not only be something that identifies with the 18 to 24 year old, you've got mature students, you've got international students, you've got students who are LGBTI who, who need uh, inclus an inclusive space and a sex positive space. And that would just be my point on that. Um, just in regards to like how do you, you know, get to people, uh, uh, you know, it's in relation to, I suppose, that you need, need jo not just the tick the box exercise of a, of a class you know, type model, we're not advocating for that. We're saying that a workshop model needs to be introduced uh, across institutions, but it needs to be in, the con in a wider concept of consent education, um, something that, you know, as, as Patrick mentioned, you know, theatre, uh, it can be in social media, it can be in videos, it can be in social media campaigns, it can be in workshops throughout the year, but the, a tick-the-box class is just not the way forward. And, uh, you know, absolutely, um, you know, when we, we do tend to see people who are interested in, you know, in being a student leader, people who are uh, you know, out there on campus who are interested already, who are working in feminist societies and other societies on campus to doing good work. They're the first to attend these and often the question is, are these the right people? I think the, the more we mainstream it, the better and it becomes then that they, it's not just that we equip people to be bystanders who are already interesting or who are already interested, but also make it as mainstream as possible like in some of the models, including in Trinity College, Dublin, where accommodation was a target and where as many people as possible uh, received um, you know, uh, consent classes as part of that. Uh, in relation to the, the question from Deputy Martin around the process of collecting data, like to my mind, there is none to little. Um, and I think that that's part of the problem. Um, you know, we've got this issue, and it was raised later on by, by, by a, a committee member around, you know, um, you know how do, it, will we see a, a drop in the numbers of people actually noting uh, violence or disclosing issues? Um, I think, similarly as to another member here, the, it will, disclosures will increase because... I have seen in my own experience, but in students' unions across the country, that where you have run sexual health and awareness guidance campaigns introducing the concept of consent, it is more so that people come into you then because they see the students' union as a place to go to disclose at that point. And so that's a concern. In relation to the question around the staff member from Deputy Martin, we would be absolutely in support of somebody being allocated in each institution to ensure that consent education is rolled out. 
uh, from Senator Ruan, the, uh, the question again about reporting. Uh, we have a serious concern around the protocol within third level education institutions at the moment with regard to where do you go. I mean, the question already arose within the DIT uh, you know, uh, submission around you know, how many go from I went to the counselling centre, I spoke to somebody there, I was dealt with you know, in the health centre, but then I didn't progress to reporting stage. Um, and we have a serious concern that the reporting structures are not clear enough uh, in our colleges uh, and, and you know, they are couched with the majority of institutions consent and issues of sexual harassment and assault are couched in dignity and respect policies that are not very accessible to students and we have a concern about that. Um, and just uh, very quickly, two last points. Uh, the question around third level being too late um, or that we should be doing it beforehand, absolutely in both, uh, both submissions I want to make it very, very clear that it is our policy uh, in USI that it should absolutely be happening way before third level. I mean, of course, the, the fact is that you have a higher popula population of sexually active young people who are, who are between, say, 17 and 24, and at that point it needs intervention. But they, the first time they hear about consent or the first time they hear about condoms shouldn't be at the shag week that USI runs um, you know, in first year of college. It's not good enough because it's not happening. There's no comprehensive RSC. And I take Deputy uh, Byrne's point with regard to our interaction with that process is important. Um, but it is. There's this good interaction, is there? Um, no, at the moment. The, 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 the sexuality and relationships education is far from uh, what it should be. Oh, no, I accept uh, that. And, no, I know that. But when you're engaging with uh, I mean, the, the NCCA and you're yeah. engaging with them, I know they're a second level, you're a third level, yeah. but uh, we, we have you made know contact. a lot about it. Like. Yeah, we have made contact with them and have asked, can we put in a submission with regard okay. to that? Yeah. Right. Um, and then, uh, because it's important, because we're seeing the effects. Yeah, yeah. That's so the, the issue. experts that hope but, to be absolutely. consulting. And then the last um, question um, by the Cahirlock with regard to um, you know, where should this sit um, and how do we make it happen? Uh, I think potentially we need to have a conversation about it being tied to the compacts. I do think we need to have that conversation. Uh, I don't have a position on it at the moment, but I do think we need to have that conversation quite quickly. And I do think, I suppose lastly, is that we, need, we do need more data because people are asking questions with regard to what's happening in institutions. And so that's why we would like to rerun the Say Something survey, which we ran in 2014. And the last point just being that we need to move away from just consent classes being the point we make and talk about consent education and respect across, um, uh, and, uh, across all levels of education and society. Thank you very much for your time. OK, uh, thank you very much, Sheena. I'm going to go to Parag last, but, but certainly not least. And just as I, I've been, been listening to the whole... Yeah, you, you go ahead, I follow you. Um, to the um, mandatory or, or otherwise in terms of it and just strikes me that if, if it was mandatory in a college and then not everybody attended and then something happened that there could be a, a, a potentially a situation there but I do know that Minister Mitchell O'Connor launched NUIG smart concept uh, workshops um, recently and uh, I think at that she said that, sex, that sexual consent courses should be mandatory for students in all third level colleges so I'm just wondering Corrie, do you share that view um, and then obviously you, you'll be responding to some of the other. Yeah sure so I mean just as briefly as I can I, I suppose it's really important to use strong language when you're coming from a position where you know there's been you know little or no activity historically so I think it's very important to make a strong impact and a statement of purpose so that's why I think using a word like mandatory is, you know, deliberate, deliberately, you know, a strong way to put it and putting it out to colleges then to work out what does that mean for you. Uh, so what we've seen through our um, travels through the education system, like working now with, you know, up to 10 different institutions from Belfast to Cork, from Galway to Dublin, uh, we've seen really the range of different settings in, into which this work will slot you know, immediately. Sometimes it's very student union driven, sometimes it's student service driven, sometimes it's a balance. So there's really just a unique kind of configuration there and that's, you know, those are the lessons that we've learned from. You mentioned uh, uh, IT Tralee where Jackie Rutledge, uh, who works in the health promotion department, has been, you know, inspirational and, and helped show us how you can actually integrate students safely within the whole program of education that you're trying to do. But I really just want to mention a couple of points just for clarification in terms of what we offer. So it's a workshop and we deliberately use that word because that implies that you're active, you're involved, you're doing a range of different activities, you're up out of your chair, 
doing individual tasks, you're working with a small group of people as well and exchanging views with them, and then you're doing whole group tasks. So, you know, at the same time where we bring in information from outside is where we draw on data that we have from over 3,000 students who have responded to surveys and to scenarios that we have uh, presented to them like via online formats. So no matter what the view is within the room, because we're offering you an ambiguous scenario, is a smile enough? Did these people have too much to drink? Uh, we can also give you information back from your peers outside of the room, which is really important. So we have a same-sex scenario, for example, where the question is, you know, should they have talked more because there was misunderstanding and, and some non-consenting behaviour? And what we can show is 90% of your uh, peers outside the room who have done our online survey say, it's okay to ask. You can clarify, and then we work with the people in the room to ask, well, you know, what would you say? and we get their words, and we can come back to those words repeatedly during the course of a workshop, you know? So I think that's really in, in important in terms of the inclusivity. Also in terms of one of the scenarios that we provide is where there is a man who is, who is uh, subject to harassment by a woman. So that's another really important model that, that has to be spoken about. Um, and also in terms of like relationship issues as well, consent in long-standing relationships versus the kind of prototypical kind of hookup type scenario. So all those things are <clears throat> extremely important in terms of the makeup of a workshop and what makes it interactive and why we get scores of like four out of five from the students, including in Trinity College in 2016, when we provide this. And it's really, I think, encouraging that that uh, type of result is not being obtained by specialised people who are delivering the workshop, but it is people who we have trained and then go on to get those really positive results from the students that they work with. So that's really important. It is effective. But what I'd really like to do then in finishing would be to interest you in a much bigger vision, right? So, I mean, we can get bogged down in issues around mandatory and so forth, but we want to see the big picture. And ideally, that would, as several people have said, that would not just be simply a workshop as an island of civility and then you walk out and whatever else is going on. We need to be targeting people via like what we're doing at the moment now with short consent videos where you get to choose the decision points and whether these people are going to back out of this scenario, whether they're going to go ahead with it and so forth. And also through the theatre performance, which is really, I think, one of the only ways that we could reach you know, the thousands of students that you're talking about within that vital couple of weeks of, of orientation. Um, but we have also seen this deployed in different kind of settings as well. Like, so in UL, they are scheduling this into class. In GMIT, they're scheduling this into class. In NCAD, they're scheduling this into class hours. In, in Galway, that opportunity isn't available to, to us at the moment, so we work that into a student accommodation model similar to as they do in, in, in Trinity. But, you know, so we have to look at the bigger picture. This should not just be one hour of experience. This should be a repeated uh, message that's based on good, solid research evidence that you're updating quite regularly and that you're seeing right throughout the course of the year. Okay? And secondly, in terms of second level, we now have possibly the only opportunity that we'll ever have to have these different levels of education speaking to each other. So because we're saying, well, what should we do in colleges? What should we do in schools? Is the perfect opportunity to have a common language and a stepped, graded approach to how we're going to talk about consent at second level and third level based around a common message and based around these kind of common features of interaction and dialogue, but which is obviously uh, tailoring to the individual user needs that you have at school, where you have curiosity about biological aspects of sexual health, and in, in, in colleges where people are much more interested in issues of, of equality and diversity as well. Um, and we can, in turn, we can tap into the ongoing issues that we totally need to have uh, debate about in regard to alcohol, relationships, communication and mental health, which is what makes consent such an interesting issue that sheds light on a number of different aspects of young adult uh, development. And so we, we also need to approach this in a very positive way, because coming out of the school's environment where 75% of students say that they have not had satisfactory uh, sex education, the idea of a consent workshop is threatening on several levels. 
when you get into third level education. So from the point of view of women who we know experience sexual harassment, they, they may encounter the idea of a consent workshop as possibly a threatening experience. And in terms of men walking into a consent workshop with no background knowledge of what that involves, they could also experience it as threatening as well. Am I going to be put on the spot? Are they going to ask me stuff? And uh, so we, we really need to embrace this as a positive opportunity and as a unique opportunity. And so your committee has this unique opportunity to speak across the different levels and uh, well we'd be really interested to, to help you with that. Thank you. Thank you Parag. Um, can I thank every one of you for your insights and for the experiences that, that you've had in terms of the rollout in relation to your particular areas. I think it was a fascinating discussion. I think it's very clear we have a lot to do in this area and if any of you wish to um, come back to us with further information or further thoughts, we'll ensure that that's incorporated into our final report in terms of the recommendations that we will be making to the Minister on it. But again, appreciate your time. Uh, it's, time is always valuable and of course your insights. As there is no further business for this committee, um, I am suspending this. Uh, so it is adjourned until 3.30 on Tuesday the 6th of November. 2018 and um, the subject matter will be advised on that. Thank you.